Welcome back, listeners, to Snippet Sports Science, proudly brought to you by EliteForm.com. I'm Chris Cavillio, joined by my co-host, Jared Coleman-Stark. Welcome aboard today. Thank you. How are you doing, Chris? Very well. And yourself? Pretty well. Good to hear. So today's paper, everyone, is around eccentric loading. And this obviously has gained a lot of popularity, seems to be around the whole social media world and has relevance obviously to us because we have an interest in strength development. And the paper is actually called Effects of Accentuated Eccentric Loading on Muscle Properties, Strength, Power and Speed in Resistance Trained Rugby Players. This paper comes out of the Auckland University of Technology from New Zealand. And it's a really great cast of authors here. Jamie Douglas, Simon Pearson, who's now joined us at the Queensland Academy of Sport, Angus Ross, who's done some fantastic work in the world of eccentric training and just in in strength, speed, power athletes, and Mike McGuigan. And look, just as a really basic background here, the purpose of this study is just to compare the effects of slow and fast tempo resistance training, incorporating accentuated eccentric loading compared with traditional resistance training. I think this has really good relevance for us because I think sometimes as practitioners, we're thinking, is it a fast or a slow type tempo? Just to kick it off, Jared, do you want to just go through some basic background information around where this paper came from? As most of the listeners know, traditional resistance training usually uses a fixed set load. You put a couple of plates onto a barbell and then that's what you lift. Whereas what you can do is we know that with eccentric lifting, you can actually move more load. And so if you accentuate the eccentric portion of the load, you can get a stronger stimulus. And we know that we've seen stronger adaptations on the back of that. We also know that accentuated eccentric training elicits a novel adaptive signal. And so you're looking for novel stimuli for athletes who are relatively desensitized to traditional training. If you haven't used any accentuated eccentric training with them, this might be a novel stimulus to be able to get a little bit more out of them. Yeah, definitely. And I think also in well-trained strength athletes, sometimes this type of work gets forgotten a little bit and being able to revisit it in periods of time, it A, injects the different types of proposed mechanisms such as increased muscle fascicle length, muscle hypertrophy, a shift towards a faster muscle phenotype where there's a possible increase in type 2 fiber compositions and also enhancements in stretch shortening cycle function. Therefore, when you look at it, it it actually has great physiological sense, but also just as a type of a training block, it also breaks up that monotony of just typical isokinetic type training. I think it could easily be regarded as sort of the original super maximal training for those high-end athletes that are well prepared for it, that you can put a little bit more stimulus into their training. And those things like increasing the stretch shortening cycle and increasing the fast control length, those are perfect for athletic movements where you have a really full range of motion that you need to be accelerating through quickly. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree there. A little bit of background here also is around just rugby players in just general. They're required to develop several conflicting adaptations simultaneously, such as maximal strength and aerobic power. And I know definitely when I used to work at Bath Rugby quite some time a while ago, I guess when you look at it, rugby players need to be good at everything. They need to be strong. They need to be fit. They need to be fast. And so being able to get these simultaneous improvements can be made across the divergent components of fitness, concurrent training, which all these possibly attenuate the magnitude of adaptations that we would get if you could train them individually. The theory behind this was is that with the authors, they thought the inclusion of some sort of accentuated eccentric loading could be a particularly useful method of further stimulating the neuromuscular system within a concurrent training program for the rugby player. Right. I think it really hits a lot of your bases and gives you a lot of bang for your buck, which are two very large practical application components that we like to look for in training interventions. Definitely. And the advantage of this study here is that no studies prior to this have compared the effects of slow and fast tempo accentuated eccentric loading protocols with equivalent traditional resistance training protocols. So it it looked at fast and slow tempo versus traditional resistance training protocols. And that's the good thing about this. It's, It's been able to go something that hasn't actually been looked at before. I think it's really interesting to look at those differences between fast and slow eccentrics because I think as probably most of the listeners will know, with a fast eccentric, you can move a lot more load. Obviously, if it's too heavy, you won't be able to do a really slow controlled movement. Whereas if you're allowing for additional accentuation of that eccentric phase by using a fast tempo, 
you might be able to get an even more super maximal intensity out of it. And they've got a really interesting study design that they've used here that I, I really like. I think it's quite clever, where they've done the four weeks of slow eccentric tempo, accentuated eccentric training versus your slower traditional resistance training. And then they've had a two-week period in between and follow that up with four weeks comparing the fast eccentric tempo compared to faster traditional resistance training. Within this, they also looked at other dependent variables, and these included muscle architectural properties, strength, reactive strength, power, and speed. And these were measured at three time points during the study period, including pre-testing at baseline, mid-testing, and after the first training phase, and post-testing after the second training phase. They originally recruited 17 male resistance trained academy rugby players. They did unfortunately lose three of these players due to contact injuries uh, during the study. So they weren't able to complete the study, which does come back to bite us in the behind later because we'll see that some of the baseline, the pre-measures were a little bit different between the groups. And I'm sure that must have been very frustrating for the researchers. But what can you do about injury, you know? That's exactly right. When you look at the body mass, it, these are reasonably sized athletes as well. So average of 97 kilos plus or minus around 11.6. So you're anywhere from you know 86 to around 108 kilos. So reasonably sized athletes here. And the other really important thing here, which I like about when I read studies, is they have a good 1RM back squat where they're looking at around 1.7 kilos per body mass. So you've got good, strong athletes in this study, which are hard to find, as you would attest to. Hey, Jared? A hundred percent. And so, yeah, these are, these are nearly 100 kilo guys. They're squatting 1.7 times their body weight. That means most of these guys could squat about 170 kilos. So pretty strong guys. Yeah, definitely. And Jared alluded to this a little bit earlier around the procedure. We'll just go into it a little bit more detail. They were pair matched based on lower body strength and then allocated through block randomization to either an accentuated eccentric loading group, where they had about seven athletes or a traditional resistance training group, another N of seven, to be completed within the strength and power-based gym sessions. Two four-week training phases separated by two weeks were completed. The first four-week phase emphasized on a slow three-second eccentric tempo, a lower intensity and higher repetitions, whereas the second four-week phase emphasized a fast one-second eccentric tempo, a higher intensity and concomitantly lower repetitions in the back squat exercise. The eccentric load for the accentuated eccentric load group was 18 to 25% above the traditional resistance training load during the strength sessions. Training load during the strength sessions were matched within approximately 10% intensity relative volume. Therefore, overall, the concentric intensity was 4 to 5% lower in the accentuated eccentric loading group. Going on further, the two strength sessions were completed on a Monday and a Thursday, and these began with either the back squats according to the slow eccentric loading protocol or the traditional resistance training, whereas the power sessions were completed on a Tuesday, and they began with the similar type lower body movements. One thing I thought was pretty cool in this study was the custom-built Smith machine that they used for this. So they have this machine that provided pneumatic assistance on the lifting during the concentric portion of the movement. And so they would preload it with the uh, eccentric load is my understanding. And then the machine would actually assist them for the concentric portion. So yes, they did have to complete the training in a Smith machine, but it's quite cool to have a device like that. I think that's always the challenge when you get truly strong athletes being able to perform that type of super maximal loading where you want to go heavy, but you need to do it safely as well. As much as you say, well, look, it's in a Smith machine versus free weight. These are huge loads that potentially some athletes could be doing. You know, you could get some throwers who could be benching 200 kilos traditionally with no super maximal loading. You know, we're looking at like loads of 240, 250, just to get that accentuated eccentric loading that's necessary for the muscle fibers. Right, and particularly when you've got that additional eccentric load, which could be a super maximal load, it's quite difficult to control on the eccentric phase of the movement. And it, it does, even with experienced lifters, it does pose an increased risk of injury. So it's a safe bet to use a more controlled environment like that. 
Yeah, it's a cool machine. I think it's quite unique to Sprints in New Zealand as well. So then they've got some very smart people working there and they've been able to use that to, to good effect. Yeah, smart people building smart machines. They've got yeah. a lot of cool equipment there. Yeah, and the other thing to note here is that in the traditional resistance training group, they perform their regular back squat uh, free weight barbell in a squat rack. And these subjects were acquired to a knee angle of approximately 90 degrees and they actually put a plyometric box set that was individualized to their height. So just that comparison of free weight versus Smith machine in the two different groups here. And they use that same 90 degree angle when they did the uh, one repetition maximum squatting. So just bear in mind that all of these, all these squatting numbers that we've been discussing are all based on that 90 degree angle with a touch to a plyometric box. To be honest here, we, you know, you say oh, 90 degrees versus parallel. We're talking about rugby union athletes who they could be inhibited by actual just issues with their limbs and, and, and joints and so forth. So sometimes that's a consideration you just need to take with the group that you have. Like, yeah, you'd like to get that nice parallel position. But the reality is, is that these players are pretty beat up. And, you know, to be able to lift their, to a load that you'd be happy with, you know, sometimes you say, well, you know, 90 degrees is fine. You know, it's, that's not a bad depth. Right. And for rugby players, I mean, where do you really need to be producing the force? It's not at below 90 degrees. So yeah, that's exactly right. Other measurements that they took within the study here, one was an inertial load cycling power. And once again, another custom built machine by the crew here in New Zealand, they used a cycle ergometer in this sense here. And this was used to assess concentric muscle power of the lower limb. And this involves the determination of torque delivered to the ergo flywheel across a range of pedaling rates. The product of the flywheel inertia, angular velocity and angular accelerations were applied to the flywheel and used to calculate power. Subjects completed three trials separated by two minutes. And this was done maximally. Instantaneous power and torque data were sampled, such as peak power per kilo or watts per kilo, and the cadence at which peak power occurred. And this was as in revolutions per minute or RPM. For the half meter drop jump, the subjects completed one practice jump followed by three maximal attempts with 30 seconds of recovery between each trial. They were explicitly asked to simultaneously attempt to minimize their ground contact time while maximizing their jump height, but to prioritize brief ground contact time. And hands akimbo. I remember in one of our very first podcasts, Jared, I said akimbo. What a great word. Yeah, it's a perfect word. It just, you know, it's a basic body position. We should all know it, right? And for those people who, you know, we all know what a drop jump is, but half a meter is actually a reasonable height, to be honest. And if you're not used to it, it takes a little bit of get, getting used to being able to drop with confidence and being able to come up off the ground. So that's a good height that they actually did. Right. And I actually find half a meter, you know, post training two days afterwards, it is a bit of a stimulus. Like you do pull up a bit sore from that, just from the eccentric loading on, on a half meter drop jump. And look within this contact time, flight time, and a reactive strength index, which is flight time divided by contact time. And these were determined and used in the analysis at the end. And another measurement is actually the leg spring stiffness. And this was also calculated. Then for the 40 meter sprint profiling, they have the athletes warm up and then complete two maximum 40 meter sprints separated by approximately five minutes. The maximum velocity or VMAX and the time splits at 10, 20 and 40 meters were determined. Contact time, flight time and step rate at maximum velocity were determined from each sprint. Vertical stiffness and leg stiffness at maximum velocity were as modeled using the methods previously described by other researchers. And also the last measurement here was muscle architecture. And they used an in vivo muscle architecture that this was measured through an ultrasound transducer. So just in summary here, the study design, they had the pre-testing in week one. So in day one, they did their 40 meter sprint, the cycling power, day two, muscle architecture, drop jump, back squat. Then they had their first training phase, which was four weeks long. They used the two interventions. The control was slow, traditional resistance training or slow eccentric loading intervention. They tested at week six, similar kind of profile over two days. Then they had on week seven, they had the week off to actually rest and recover and hopefully have that little bit of a washout here. So they've actually probably had more closer to two weeks washout period. Then they started training phase number two, and this is weeks eight to 11, and they used the fast protocols or the fast accentuated eccentric loading. So that was over one second and fast traditional resistance training. At week 12, 
they did their post testing once again on day one 40 meter sprint and cycling power followed by on the second day muscle architecture drop jump and back squat a good training block definitely a great training block and we know from this group they're going to have very well designed training programs i was a little i went back and forth a little bit on how much of a washout that two week period was that was really because in that first week of the two weeks between the two training blocks there is a i mean there's a one repetition maximum back squad and there's a lot of maximal testing going on in that first week so usually i would think you know about 10 days to recover from pretty severe uh eccentric training but it, yeah it's kind of it's probably within their time frame the most they could get away with as we found in in your journey in your postgraduate work jared that it's the happy medium of what we would traditionally do in the real world right. versus academia. Right, exactly. And I think they found a nice happy balance there, which is pretty cool. Definitely a very interesting, very fun study design that they have here. So now that we've covered the methodology, the study design, let's go ahead and jump into the results. Chris, can you tell me what they found regarding the effects of the slow eccentric loading versus the traditional resistance training protocol in that first four-week block? Yeah, what they found here was that mid-testing after the first four-week training phase, a small improvement was found in back squat strength for those who completed the slow, accentuated eccentric loading. This improvement was deemed to be likely superior with an effect size of 0.48 compared to slow traditional resistance training. Furthermore, the slow eccentric loading resulted in small improvements in 20 and 40 meter sprint times. And the improvement in the 40 meter sprint time with slow eccentric loading was possibly superior compared against the slow traditional resistance training. Furthermore, this eccentric loading also elicited likely small improvements in maximum velocity, contact time, step rate, and leg stiffness. Improvements in the maximum velocity were around 0.2 meters per second. And in respect to contact time, they saw an improvement of about 0.01 of a second. Vertical stiffness, according to the calculation, the formula used improved about 0.05 kilonewtons per meter per kilogram. And these were likely greater with the slow eccentric loading program compared to the slow traditional resistance training. Leg stiffness did not exhibit a clear change with either protocol. Looking at their drop jump, there was a possible small increase in the flight time with slow traditional resistance training. However, this had no effect on the RSI performance measure. So that's the reactive strength index. Neither slow protocols influence muscle architecture variables either. So I've just gone through the, the slow eccentric load. It seemed to have some really small yet good effects on performance here. Jared, do you want to just go through the fast accentuated centric loading protocol? At post-testing, after the second four-week phase of training, there was a likely reduction in drop jump contact time, which was observed in the fast eccentric load group, resulting in a possible small increase in reactive strength index and likely moderate increase in leg stiffness. In contrast to the slow phase of training, which Chris just went through, there were moderate reductions in 10, 20, and 40 meter times with fast accentuated eccentric loading. Furthermore, there were small reductions in maximum velocity in both fast AEL and fast TRT, the accentuated eccentric loading group and the traditional group. No differences were observed between fast accentuated eccentric loading and fast traditional resistance training for any sprint performance variable. There was a possible small increase in fastest lateral explanation angle with fast traditional resistance training. However, there was no clear difference compared to the fast accentuated eccentric load. Some nice findings there, hey, Jared? Yeah, quite a study. I mean, they, they looked at so many different outcome measures and had such a great training program. You, you just know from the study design that something is going to come out of it. Yeah, definitely. And, and look, you know, just in summary here, their main findings was that four weeks of slow accentuated eccentric loading resistance training was superior to slow traditional resistance training. So this is going down over three second period. And this improved lower body strength and sprinting speed in these rugby players. By contrast, besides a possible increase in reactive strength, a second four week training phase of fast accentuated eccentric loading, so that's over one second, did not seem to elicit any further improvements in strength or speed. And this may have compromised by the previous observed enhancement in sprint performance. 
Right. You're always going to have some effects from the training block that preceded it on the following training blocks. So it makes sense. The authors then go on to write that the superiority of slow, accentuated, eccentric load in increasing lower body strength in this study is arguably underpinned by neural mechanisms, as there were no clear changes in the vastus lateralis muscle thickness, vascular angle, or fascicle length. Although the program volume was closely matched between the two groups, those completing the slow, accentuated eccentric load were exposed to absolute loads 18 to 25% higher than those completing slow traditional resistance training. That's what we were talking about in the introduction, where because you have the eccentric loading, you're able to tolerate greater loads. And that's kind of the basis of the stimulus that you get from the accentuated eccentric loading. It does seem that the traditional resistance training protocol provided an insufficient stimulus to increase strength in four weeks in a resistance training cohort undergoing concurrent aerobic training. These are athletes that are fairly desensitized to a training stimulus. Remember, they're about 100 kilo rugby players who are squatting about 170 kilo on average. So they're quite strong and you need to hit them with more than just a single four-week bulk. Concurrent aerobic training, possibly attenuated myofibrillar protein synthetic rates in response to both protocols. However, the additional neural stimulation with slow accentuated eccentric loading elicited a small increase in strength independent of changes in muscle cross-sectional area. The improvement in 40-meter sprint performance with slow accentuated eccentric load was accompanied by an increase in maximum velocity and underlying kinematic variables. The ability to apply greater mass-specific vertical forces and possibly maintain a stiffer leg spring seem to underpin the attainment of a faster maximum velocity. And when you look into previous research, look, they've identified the efficacy of eccentric training protocols in increasing tendon stiffness and upregulating muscle collagen synthesis rates, and therefore the improvements in this max velocity with the slow eccentric protocol may have been partly related to these modulated stiffness properties of tendons and fascicle elements within the lower limbs that all kind of starting to come together with previous research and what they actually saw here in this study. So what do you think of this study, Chris? As per usual, I really enjoy these type of papers. I feel I can take this information and apply it with the athletes I work with. And I think that's really important here. It's interesting to be able to explore that one centric, eccentric type lowering protocol, that faster type movement, and to see what I can get out of the athletes I work with. And I think sometimes, you know, we have certain athletes that may not be able to handle that three second bigger loads, and therefore they might actually respond better to the, the one century eccentric loading. I think it just gives further evidence to the athlete population that we're working with that there are periods of time over four weeks that we can actually elicit a response. And I think that's probably another thing just in reflection is, is that they found a response in four weeks. That's a short period of time. And when you're looking at being able to get those performance increases, I think that's quite positive. What about you, Jared? Is there any thoughts that come to your mind after this paper? I definitely agree with what you said. I think I think a really big thing to think about in relation to whenever you have eccentric training is the recovery from it, because it is just about the hardest training there is to be able to recover from. And like we talked a little bit about the, uh, the recovery period between the two training blocks, but also, and the authors do note that they would have liked to have done a, another testing session, maybe two weeks after the end of the second block, because that would give time for those adaptations to appear. And just from other research that I've looked at in terms of how powerful is the eccentric stimulus and how long does it take to recover from it, I think maybe more than a concentrated block of eccentric training, I think it's something that's really good to just kind of touch on just about every week because you have that repeated value effect that helps protect you from how damaging eccentric exercise can be. And so if you're touching on it, at least in one session each week, you can maintain that protection uh, against how much muscle damage might occur. And then you don't have to be repairing each time. You don't have to repair, destroy, and rebuild. You can just be building up on whatever you previously have. And also with the recovery period, for you to fully recover your strength from that one big, heavy, eccentric session, you want to be able to hit it again maybe about a week later. So to me, an eccentric session is something that's really good at about 
once per week would be about perfect to me. What do you think about that, Chris? Yeah, definitely. And I've actually included a lot more eccentric work in my own strength programs with the athletes I work with. And there's always, I'll always add a calf eccentric exercise. There'll always be a Nordic or a hamstring eccentric exercise, but I've actually added a more of a quad knee quad dominant type eccentric exercise as well once a week i actually add in sometimes also isometric as well um, which kind of touches a little bit on alex natira's work and a lot of his recent podcasts and articles that he's put out with the training of his strength power athletes and the athletes have responded well to it and after those initial sessions they've had no additional soreness from that point forward so they're actually able to lift quite big loads. And after that first session, they've got that little bit of soreness and actually go out and perform quite well in their own training. You know, so I think that gives really good evidence of putting it in there. And as you said, there's that protective mechanism. There's a performance aspect as well there, which I think coupled together is, is really powerful for athletes that you work with. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think maybe one of the final things to think about is isometric is exceptional preparation for that eccentric loading but there are also other forms of eccentric loading that we can do we don't have to just do the accentuated eccentric loading we can actually do submaximal eccentric loading as well particularly for preparatory work if someone hasn't really done much eccentric loading previously they can they can do lighter loads with the eccentric loading and as well there's other types of exercise that are very eccentric heavy, such as stretching is eccentric exercise and weightlifting as well. You know, doing your power cleans with that impact is a pretty strong eccentric load. And then uh, our favorite, the K-Box. Yeah, definitely. And as with everything, it's a well-rounded program put together, finding what responds well to the athlete you're working with. Not one program fits all athletes, as we all know. And it's the beast that you're working with. You know, how do you maximize it, taking all this information in that takes time to find what responds with your athletes? All right. It's all about putting more tools in the toolbox. And this is a great tool. Yeah, exactly right. I think it's been able to think about that fast one second eccentric loading protocol. I think that's quite interesting there. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And thank you listeners for coming on board. Remember to visit our socials at Snippet Science. Also to visit our sponsor, EliteForm.com, doing great things in velocity-based training equipment. And tune in next week. Thanks for listening.